very good morning to you. It is Tuesday. Uh, I hope that you woke up well, 13th uh, day of December 2022. Can you imagine? We're almost halfway towards the middle of the month, so I hope that the month has been good to you so far. Welcome, this is AM Live. My name is Winnie Lubeme. There's a lot to cover in today's conversation. And of course, our special focus will be on the universal health coverage and the future of medicine. Because yesterday was not only uh, Jamhuri Day here in the country, but it was also Universal Coverage, Universal Health Coverage Day. And of course, we all know that that was launched in 2019 here in the country. So how are we doing? What are some of the gaps? What can we do to make sure that everybody has equal access and that is as far as health is concerned because health again at the end of the day is human right but according to the who 30 percent of the world's population do not have access to health so the big question is why the disparity and what can we do to bridge this gap so of course we'll be talking about that conversation a little bit later uh, during the show so you want to stick around if you are watching us and of course want to contribute towards the same as well the numbers will be down on your screen you can give us a call or better yet contribute via our social media platforms but for now let's start with the stories that we have so far and president william ruto has announced that 11,000 young people in nairobi county who were initially under the kazim Tan initiative will be employed in january 2023 by both national and county governments while well, the government also says it will import at least 10 million bags of food stuff including maize in a bit to address food shortage in the country. NTV's senior political uh, reporter Duncan Khaimba with the details. President William Ruto led the country in marking 59 years since Kenya gained independence and 58 years as a republic. In his maiden Jamhuri Day speech to the country, whose theme was technology and innovation, President Ruto largely focused on his administration's seemingly main flagship project, the Hustler Fund, as he reported what he framed as a 12-day success story. The Hustler Fund has accumulated savings of close to 400 million shillings in just 12 days, well on track to a billion shillings in the next few days. Ruto did not spare those opposed to his pet project with questions being raised on the legal framework upon which the fund is predicated. Be humane, be kind, please allow the people borrowing on the Hustler Fund to also enjoy low interest rates the way you and your families are enjoying. In efforts to address unemployment, President Ruto says technology construction of housing units and tree planting campaigns will be used to offer solutions. Beginning January, we are going to hire 11,000 young people to create the army that will green our city, those that were working under the old program of Kazi Mtaani. The government says it has partnered with the private sector to engage suppliers to import 6 million bags of affordable fertilizer for farmers. 2 million bags have already arrived at the port of Mombasa and the remaining 4 million bags will arrive in the first week of January. We are going to import 10 million bags of, 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 of different assorted types of food including maize so that we can close the gap temporarily because of the harvest that was limited in this year's agricultural season occasioned by climate change and failure of rain. This was President William Ruto's second national event to preside over after leading the nation in marking Mashuja in October. Duncan Haemba, NTV. Na Mchungaji Dorcas. 
All right. Thank you very much, Duncan. And elsewhere, many Kenyans throng the national uh, Nyayo Stadium for Jamhuri Day celebrations to claim a promise made by President William Ruto at the Jamhuri Tech and Innovation Summit that Kenyans would walk away with a 16-unit online scholarship facilitated by the Arizona State University. So what next for Kenyans who successfully registered for the scholarship? Well, NTV's Melita Oletengas reports. As Kenyans streamed into the Nyayo National Stadium Monday, many of them were looking forward to one thing, to get a scholarship promised to attendees of Jamhuri Day celebrations, and it came to pass. It is now time to keep that promise. There is a QR code near you. Mumeipata. Scan and access the scholarship now. A 16-unit course that would have costed you 100000 And as soon as the president finished his speech, hundreds of Kenyans took to their phones to scan the QR code projected on big screens at the stadium and on pamphlets. The QR code redirecting them to a registration portal for the 100 million learners program, Bootcamp, offering different courses online. We were doubting at first, but so I mean, we were doubting. Thomas, I came to confirm, yeah, it's just regrettable that my children refused to come, but it is the best decision. I have been registered so far, and I have been successful. I have a confirmation message through my email. President William Ruto also indicated plans by the government to digitize government services to ease delivery of services. We are going to have a 100 thousand kilometer super highway that is going to be built to enable internet access our homes. The government also promised to supply subsidized fertilizer by use of e-vouchers with the president calling upon farmers to register. Under the e-voucher system, the government pays 40% of the cost and farmers the remaining 60%. And I want to encourage our farming community to register themselves because going forward, our fertilizer subsidy program is going to be dis is, is going to be dispensed on the internet, on e voucher so that we can eliminate brokers and eliminate cartels and ensure that targeted farmers have access to fertilizer. Many Kenyans are optimistic that the Arizona State University boot camp will be a stepping stone into the future. They hope that they will tap into the digital economy. Melita Oletenges, NTV at the Nyayo National Stadium, Nairobi. All right, thanks Melita. And during this year's Jamhuri Day celebrations, the president officiated the celebration as well as the consecration and presentation of regimental and presidential colors to the 23rd Mechanized Infantry Battalion of the Kenya Army. This was present uh, President Ruto's first such ceremony as NTV's Leila Mohammed explains. This is Jamhuri Day, President William Ruto's second national day as Commander-in-Chief of Kenya's Defense Forces, was a unique one. The President administered a key ceremony to present regimental and presidential colors to the very first Mechanized Infantry Battalion Unit of the 8th Mechanized Infantry Brigade of the Kenya Army. Kenya has kept this tradition from the colonial era to celebrate the granting of independence and change of status of these units that form brigades within the major service of the military. When the Union Jack was lowered and the Kenyan flag hoisted, the name King's African Rifles was dropped. The Kenyan military renamed the infantry units the Kenya Rifles. The 4th Commander-in-Chief Uhuru Kenyatta presented the colors to the 6th Brigade Kenya Rifles during his tenure under which the 17th, 19th and the 21st Battalions all received their colors. And I request you. On this 59th anniversary of a significant moment of Kenya's history, President William Ruto handed over the two colors to the 23 Mechanized Infantry Battalion the first of three units to use sophisticated weapons in armored vehicles like APCs or infantry fighting vehicles in their line of duty. For Allah, 
Asha, the custodian of these scholars. At the day's ceremony, religious leaders from the civilian church joined hands with the military chaplains to pray for the flags draped on drums bearing the battalion maroon colors. Once the commander-in-chief was safely back in the podium, the two majors walked back to the parade, mounted by the three services of the KDF, the red tunic of the Kenya army, taking the lion's share of the 160-man parade. Similar traditions still take place in the United Kingdom, with the Platinum Jubilee celebrations of the late Queen Elizabeth II's reign also witnessing such a significant event. This brigade has been led by the current force commander of ECRAF, who heads troops into DRC. It has conducted special operations, as well as sending troops to serve in the peace mission inside Somalia under Artemis. Leila Mohamed, NTV. Well, thanks, Leila. And still on Jamuhi Day celebrations, more than 5,000 members of the Pemba community in the county of Kilifi have expressed joy at the announcement by President William Ruto to recognize them officially. While addressing the nation during Jamuhi Day celebrations in Nairobi, President Ruto announced that the government is working on modalities to grant citizenship to members of the Pemba community in the uh, North Coast. A group of Pemba community members spoke to NTV in Mayungu village, Kilifi North, this uh, last evening, saying that they had been harassed by government agencies for a long time. They cited lack of the Kenyan identity documents as key reason for not developing as a people. 41-year-old Juma Yusuf Juma, who is a community leader, said that his tribesmen resort to have their children adopted to enable them enjoy basic government services. <laughs> Tumepitia changamoto nyingi sana katika maisha yetu tokea enzi ya mababu zetu tulipata hiyo historia mpaka tukaona sisi wenyewe kuwa udogo wetu tu, tumekulia na tabu sana kwa sababu ya kukosa uraia lakini leo niko na furaha ambayo kwa siwezi kuielezea tuko na furaha ndani ya furaha tuko na furaha sije leo kama tutalala tupate usingizi ama tutakesha kwa furaha tulionayo the pemba community living in kilifi county that has for a long time suffered Without identity, the government of Kenya is now going to work on the modalities to ensure that the Pemba community acquire citizenship of the Republic of Kenya. And yesterday's celebration saw Kenyans from all walks of life across the country celebrate Jamhuri Day in the best way they know how. So what exactly does Jamhuri Day mean to the people? Well, NTV caught up with a few Kenyans and this is what they had to say. Jamhuri Day is about uh, when we got an independence. And independence means that we must come together as a family and as a nation. Jamhuri is freedom. Yeah? Freedom, self-empowerment. Jamhuri Day mimi najua ni siku uh, Kenya ilipata independence ilipata ile uhuru na ikakuwa tukapewa sisi as Kenyans the power to uh, to do our things the power to express ourselves Jamhuri Day is independence I mean so far we are here it's God it's you know we yeah, tuko 59 today na tunajivunia na tunaomba president aweze kutushughulikia pia si kama youth the talented youths Nile ya kutukumbusha tulitoka kwa minyorore ya mkoloni Sa hii tunajisimamia si wenyewe Na ndio maana tunaisherekea maana tunajiangalia mali tumetoka Mbaka mali tumefikia and the first ever Nairobi City Festival was held at Uhuru Park, attracting over 50 local musicians, chefs, and artists. Well, the festival dubbed the Vibe of the City is set to be held every year on December 12th. And Tevis Nginakirori was there in our reports. The gates of Uhuru Park opened to the public at 2 p.m. for the first ever Nairobi City Festival from those looking to get a quick selfie as others were looking for a quick adrenaline rush. The festival did not attract Nairobians alone. This lady traveled all the way from Kitale on Sunday evening just to be part of the Jamhuri Day celebrations at Uhuru Park. The 
The Nairobi CEC for Inclusivity and Public Participation, Silantoy Suzan, says the purpose of the Nairobi Festival is to celebrate the culture that punctuates county number 47. The Nairobi Festival is about enhancing our creating, creative economy. We want to proactively engage our creative economy to make sure that it succeeds. There's a lot of potential in that space and I think it's very undertapped. The youth made up the majority of those in attendance, with many of them gearing up for the talent show slated for later in the week, where they will get a chance to showcase their talent in art, music, fashion, among other areas. Art in itaji support, in itaji appreciation. Appreciate art. Art appreciate for the chance to see that it event I think uh, the government has ile, ile perception ya youth wanataka handout peke yake but my youth wanataka handout my youth wanataka platform ya kuji express Many attendees brave the rain to dance and make merry <laughs> Nairobi Governor Johnson Sakaja says his government will hold the Nairobi Festival every year on December 12th. This year's festival will run until December 17th. Despite the rains, residents are not letting that rain on their parade as day one of the Nairobi Festival has wrapped up. But day two continues on tomorrow with more appreciation of music, arts and what makes Nairobi City exactly what it is. Ngena Kirori, NTV. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ngina Kirori. And again, like they always say, come rain or shine, trust Kenyans to always ping us here. All right. Well, let's uh, put a pause on some of the stories and take a look at what is happening on the local dailies. And of course, as per usual, we'll begin with the Daily Nation, where, as you can see over here, uh, you know, the headline reads, Ruto's plan to lower food prices. And remember, the whole conversation about food prices has dominated uh, of course, uh, Kenya Kwanzaa's agenda during the campaigns and up until now, they had requested 400 days and then came back. The president came back and said, you know what, just give us a year. We'll be able to lower the food prices and all those things. So, in, And I'm curious to hear what your expectations are, and especially as far as the first 100 days is concerned, when it comes to the cost of living and, of course, particularly the food uh, prices, where, of course, um, you know, this says that the high cost of living, which was a top agenda item in the 2022 general election, headlined President William Ruto's final, uh, first rather, Jamhuri Day uh, address, as he outlined a three-phase approach to tackling the challenge. The government will ensure farmers get access to affordable fertilizer to enhance their productivity and import 10 million bags of maize to address the current shortage. Well, the third measure is to uh, is the importation by the state and the private sector of 300,000 tons of fat fertilizer before the next planting season and this is what the president said during the Jamhuri Day celebrations and of course that story is on page two, three, four, five and six all right and this is as far as the daily uh, nation is concerned but at the same time he also told the opposition leaders of we'll be looking at what exactly he said but still on the front page as far as daily nation is concerned kenya a kenyan fated for schools for tech project and this is nelly Cheboy, which i'm pretty sure we all know her by now did kenya proud she actually quit top job to set up a computer lab for children of course that story is on page eight but at the same time still on the front page of the Daily Nation, those who dined in our home have betrayed us. And of course, that is what Ida Odinga said. That story is on, is it page 20, page 10 rather, uh, as far as the Daily Nation is concerned. But still uh, on the front page, so backstory of Azimio's loss in election. Our very own Kennedy Murray did a very comprehensive feature uh, that ran yesterday as far as why exactly uh, ODM leader that is Raila Odinga actually lost. And of course, Abino uh, continues to say that things are not rosy in Mr. Raila Odinga's coalition where allies are locked in a blame game over the outcome of the August election. That is uh, on page 10, but still on the front page again of the Daily Nation. And this is as far as the KCPE results will actually, um, you know, come out next week is that what it says yes so the education cs uh, mino says that his ministry had put in place stringent measures to guard against cheating in examination so next week um you know the candidates will have their results so if uh, for the learners i know uh, not learners i mean they're ex-candidates right now um you know 
we all know how they're sort of like feeling um, as far as that is concerned. And still, um, you know, as far as Jamhuri Day is concerned, 59th Jamhuri Day, where of course those pomp and color as Ruto leads his first uh, Remember Jamhuri Day celebrations. And of course that happened yesterday as a president and thousands of Kenyans actually braced the early morning cold uh, to make sure that they witness the tech themed um, fate, all right? And of course the president, um, again, marked or led Kenyans in marking the 59th Jamhuri Day celebrations. And of course in Nairobi, a very packed stadium, uh, you know, and elaborate entertainment dominated the colorful celebrations. Uh, the first to be presided over by President Ruto, mm -hmm. right? And of course, there's so many things that came, um, you know, from the uh, celebrations, which again, we'll be looking at very, very shortly. And of course, that again continues on page three of the Daily Nation. But what we talked about on the front page of the Daily Nation, and that is the president's radical plan to address the high cost of, of commodities. He had talked about, um, you know, giving him 100 days, but again, 100 days are actually almost over, right? Um, oopsie, okay, that disappeared, all right? So let me just sort that out. All right, so inside uh, Rito's radical plan to address high cost of living, remember we talked about the three, um, you know, measures that the president, um, you know, sort of like approach that he will just uh, take to make sure that there is enough food in the country and of course also reduce the high cost of living and addressing the citizens during the Jamhuri Day celebrations, the president reiterated his commitment to ensuring Kenyans put food on the table, all right? And of course, among the things that he talked about, let me just get that um, very clearly. So one of the things that he said uh, he will take is to make sure, um, you know, that the first phase involves in, uh, involves ensuring farmers get access to affordable fertilizers to enhance their productivity. And of course, we saw, um, you know, the reduction of the prices as far as fertilizer is concerned. That happened amid, you know, a bit of discussions here and their debates as far as that is concerned. And then the second phase or the second agenda is that they're going to import 10 million bags uh, of different assorted types of food, including maize, so that, um, you know, we can close the gap. Uh, tempor temporarily because of the harvest uh, the harvest was limited in this year's agricultural season occasioned by climate change and of course failure of the rain and uh, the third intervention is that the importation of the government and um, you know the private sector of 300,000 tons that is six million bags of fertilizer before the next planting season all right so this is the three approaches that the president said um, that will take just to make sure that again you know the high cost of basic needs you know for example like unga you know cooking oil as, as as far as that is concerned that is what they says you know they will actually take that approach just to make sure that you know they reduce the same all right so that is among the things that he said that will his government will actually deliver during the uh, jamuhuri day celebration and of course uh, up until now We've seen, um, you know, the remaining four bags. No, we have 10, no, they have said 10 million, right? 10 million bags, um, you know, of uh, fertilizer, no, of maize, right, will be imported. And of course, there's a lot of conversation around the same. But of course, a consignment of 2 million bags of fertilizer has already landed at the port of Mombasa. And of course, the remaining 4 million bags will arrive in the first week of January. This is what the president said, uh, in time for the long rains. And of course, the government will continue to subsidize the price of fertilizer. And farmers, of course, will buy it at 3,500 shillings. Remember, first farmers used to buy it at around 6,000 to around 7,000 shillings, um, you know, as far as fertilizer is concerned. And of course, there's a lot of complaints as far as the high cost of product, uh, production when it comes to, you know, planting during the planting season. So the president says, we will actually reduce this. However, the Orange Democratic Movement leader, that is uh, Raila Odinga, actually uh, called on the president to, among other things, restore the flour, fuel, school fees, and electricity subsidies by 2023, and of course, restore and enhance the cash transfer to the elderly and vulnerable, as well as enhance the Linda Mama program to protect pregnant mothers and institute discipline in order, uh, order and clarity in the cabinet minister's policy declaration. So remember, there has been like a back and forth uh, between the president and ODM leader, um, you know, Raila Odinga, as far as, you know, how the president or how the government is addressing the high cost of living. And of course, at this point, I just want to bring in 
my panel to just hear what they have to say uh, as far as this is concerned. Thank you very much, Dr. Marie Claire uh, Wangari, who is a convener, Kenya Medical Association, Young Doctors Network. Thank you very much for making time for us this morning. We also have Cinnamon Nyagaka, uh, Chair, Kenya Healthcare Students Summit. Thank you very much uh, for making time for us uh, this morning. And of course, we also have Dr. David Odhiambo, who's a chair, Young Pharmacists Group, Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. Thank you very much for making time for us this morning. We're waiting for Ngalula Donald, who is a chair, Kenya student and uh, uh, novice nurses, right? We're waiting for him to join us. But again, from yesterday's celebrations, right? Jamhuri Day, there was a lot that was said, a lot happened. It was sort of like a tech uh, you know, themed um, day. What did you make of it? And and given the approach that the government is taking to make sure that you know there's enough food and the you know the the uh, prices of uh, basic commodities are lowered. I'm going to begin with you, um, Dr. Odiyam. What what did you make of of the day yesterday? So for me, I think the most most critical bit is that we had a celebration that is themed, and for me, that is a move in the first place because we are getting towards looking at what are the challenges we're having as a country and how do we address them. All right. So being tech enabled and looking at the potential and the possibilities that technology have for us, mm -hmm. that is a first move for us to get to that level and actually acknowledge that there's leadership and high political governance commitment right. to ensure that we leverage on the power of technology and make it really help us mm -hmm. scale towards addressing our issues. And I think that was a good move. All for right. the was there anything that you expected to, to hear yesterday? Mm. I think most of the issues were around what are the achievements of the government, which yeah. were outlined, mm -hmm. and also the aspiration that we're hoping for. So I think in the next couple of years as we move forward, it's a moment for us to actually see, are we really achieving them or not? Oh, no. And even the achievement, when you look at it from the mm -hmm. mention on what the Hustler Fund has been able to achieve, it's good for us as the per country. But do we have the metrics and the measure that actually can see, mm -hmm. have we been borrowing or saving? Okay. Because we're talking about the savings as an achievement, That's but true. have we achieved it? Yeah. So those are the kind of dynamics and I think it's about now critiquing and actually evaluating whether we are achieving those successes and if not then what needs to be done right. to ensure that these are realized here. Okay all right um, I hear you and of course um, like you said there, there has to be a, a way for us to measure you know some of the some of this um, achievements all right. Uh, Cinnamon what, what did you make of yesterday's celebration? Um, well I'm just following up on the food prices and high cost of living it's, it's, it's the elephant in the room currently in the country it really is, yes. and um, it's quite some ambition ambitious uh, uh, Stead, uh, process to go through and the whole idea of fertilizing uh, fertilizers and also bringing up the issue of GMOs mm. and uh, the issue will just come about in implementation and yeah. just m making our, our government accountable mm -hmm. for all these things. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess per, yeah, per yesterday's celebrations uh, we, we're definitely looking forward to Ruto's tenure and how we'll be able to implement all this and uh, improve Kenyans' uh, lifestyle and mm. making them able to uh, live comfortably mm -hmm. in this yeah. this tiring economy. Yeah. And listen, I hear you. Majority of the times, we, and we usually talk about this here, mm -hmm. uh, you know, on, on the show and, and in various shows, is that we have really good policies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and during campaigns, we have, you know, this amazing, amazing promises. But then again, when it comes to the implementation, is, the is where there's right. a really, really big issue, um, yeah. you know, as far as that is concerned. So we're waiting to see. First 100 days, the president actually talked about some of the achievements, which is on the standard. We'll be looking at it in just a moment. Um, you know, nine, the first 90 days, not even 100 days, the first 90 days, and he says, uh, you know, we have uh, achieved several things. So according to you, do you think they have, the government has achieved? Do you think what are some of the things that um, you, know, you need to see the government do? And especially within the first 100 days, because there were very, very huge promises. Um, you know, the yeah. first 100 days, <laughs> by, <laughs> by this much, and we all got excited about, uh, about the same. And of course, I'm just curious to hear what you have to say, um, you know, as far as that is concerned. So Dr. Marie Claire yesterday's celebration what are some of the things that how did it go according to you and what are some of the things that you expected to hear but you did not i mean i think yesterday's celebration being the first jamuhuri celebration for the government mm -hmm. you only you basically just lay the foundation of other commitments and commitments to meet That's from true. the previous term and That's commitments true. to meet for your term ahead mm -hmm. so i think in doing that they've already set that foundation right. and they've also ventured into new frontiers that we've never really uh, expounded on we've seen how yesterday there were the courses that were enrolled mm -hmm. for those ones who are in the stadium mm -hmm. we have talked about food security and also the element of climate change also came up okay. quite a bit yeah. 
which is something we it affects us every day but we don't really think about it in the in the hindsight of things until the chickens come to roost yeah. but i think for me especially from a health perspective the biggest thing that i will probably take from yesterday's celebration was how the government is leveraging on next year's uh, high level meeting on universal health coverage mm -hmm. by having the madaraka day celebrations mm -hmm. also focusing on universal health coverage mm -hmm. uh, in embu county right. and it will be particularly interesting to see the strides that will be made between now and then mm -hmm. on that topic because when the pilot project started out there were a lot of misconceptions and misinterpretations of what mm -hmm. UHC is mm -hmm. and on the ground that's actually not what we are going to find mm -hmm. so it will be interesting to see the road ahead yeah. with that commitment mm -hmm. what will be achieved and what will be promised probably in July mm -hmm. versus what has been promised right now Before, uh, yesterday. Yeah. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm glad that you pointed that out because I was waiting to hear the <laughs> whole aspect <laughs> about EUC because, you know, as much as we were celebrating Jamhuri Day, but also, again, it's Universal Health uh, Coverage Day. So I was expecting you guys to say, but we did not hear the president say, but it's, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. All right. Uh, and of course, continuing with, um, you know, the, the newspaper, and this is the, you know, Daily Nation. So the Battle of Titans, Ruto Raila clash on law reform plan, and the Azmio chief is questioning the president's motive in pushing for creation of official leader position okay and of course it continues to say that um, this was actually in the BBI which the president was very very firm um, you know went across the country to reject they say make sure that you know BBI again you know Kenya's rejected so now um, the president is back and of course talking about creating um, you know the position of the office rather of the official opposition leader and Raila is like so why you know why the the, the double speak uh, as far as that is concerned so of course the paragraph says as Mio Lomoda one Kenya coalition leader Raila Odinga is questioning the president's uh, motive and pushing for a constitutional amendment to provide for the office of leader of official opposition even as the ruling coalition says it can drop the position if it is not widely accepted all right and of course there's a quote here says i find it puzzling because the memorandum presents this proposals without any recognition of the fact that uh the bba reports contain all these proposals and of course the president was so against it but now he says you know what we can actually create the office of the official uh, opposition leader so that story again is on page seven of the daily nation just read through uh, to understand more about you know uh, you know the ins and outs as far as that is concerned but at the same time to some news that again will put a smile on all of our faces all right cnn feds kenyan for school tech project and i'm pretty sure by now I mean, she's not, a, she's not, the name is not, um, you know, new to all of us. Nelly Cheboy, uh, you know, has ensured that um, needy students actually get access to uh, computers. And of course, we all know she quit a high paying job just to make sure that come back home and, um, you know, create labs for students, which is a really, really good thing. I wonder what you guys have to say about this, you know, tech, um, you know, the future of technology and of course, young people coming up with this innovative ways just to make sure that everybody has, you know, and sort of like an equal playing field in as much as the internet penetration in the country is not really, really good. <laughs> We're not up to where we need it, but the president talked about it yesterday um, during the celebration. So what do you guys make of this, um, you know, of Neliche Boy's um, win, uh, you know, to Kenya? I'm gonna begin with you, Dr. Mari. Yeah, I mean, I think the most fundamental change in our societies lie in social change and it lies in giving back to community. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Nelly took a risk to venture into a gap that's already there, yeah. um, you're seeing, I'm pretty sure she wasn't going for the accolades. For her, she was bridging the gap between <coughs> technology and people in need of it. Because mm -hmm. in parts of this country, you'll have computers a compulsory subject True. and then there are no computers. So mm -hmm. you really wonder. Um, I mean, which one should come first, chicken <laughs> yes, or egg? Or the egg. So, yeah. Um, so having such an initiative actually mm -hmm. coming to front mm -hmm. is, I think, a good a push in the right direction. And it also gives uh, motivation to the millions of Kenyans who are also doing mm -hmm. various social change initiatives in mm -hmm. their communities that in time to come, all the good deeds that they are going to do will come to fruition. Mm -hmm. um, as we say in Kiswahili, tender nema nenda zako. So yeah, I absolutely. think this is literally it. But the question is then, when it comes mm -hmm. to support, right? Um, and, and I'm happy that we're all young people in this, <laughs> in this <laughs> model today, right? Majority of the times, and I think one of the, one of the 
people who again NTV spoke to as far mm -hmm. as what um, you know Jamhuri means to you and all that. No, it was during the the Nairobi fest, right? Um, and he said the government thinks that we young people we want handouts. We don't. We just want mm -hmm. that opportunity and that kind of that kind of support. So when it comes to that support, um, what more do you feel? Felt like the government needs to do. Do you feel and, and as a young person, forget the, the professional <laughs> part of it. As a young person, do you feel supported enough to to you know come up with like such innovations and enable you to sort of like provide a solution to some of these issues that you know affect the people? Because I'm sure you've experienced some, in especially in the health sector, right? Yeah. yeah. So well, when you look at it in terms of the support that the government is offering, mm -hmm. I would say not much of it is availed to us. Right. And the first bit, actually, when we just draw back from what Nelly Chiboy has achieved from mm -hmm. her level, mm -hmm. the first critical bit under driver is exposure. You'll never achieve anything unless you know it's possible. Mm -hmm. So do we have exposure level? Do we have government encouraging that kind of engagement? Mm -hmm. When we had the NAI Fest that has been happening mm -hmm. over the last week, you have to acknowledge that young people are seeing, by the way, through talent I can be able to realize my potential. Right. And that is an investment in the right direction because if I don't see it, then I'll never aspire to get to it. That's and true. if I never aspire, then I'll never do anything to get to that level. And that is a critical bit. Mm. When then we leave from that point is, after getting to know the possibilities, and from her level, she got a scholarship, got her to the US. Yeah. With that, she's now able to do all that. She sees the potential that technology has to offer. Mm -hmm. And therefore, based on that, she's now bringing it to us. Mm -hmm. From a Kenyan context, what opportunities do we have to expose yeah. people to potential, to opportunities that That's are there true. for them? Yeah. The government has not taken a lead on that. Mm -hmm. And looking at it from my own personal journey, looking at it, I did my university graduate program at JQuet as pharmacy. Mm -hmm. When we go back to school, the basic concept on training is about you getting the knowledge that you need to apply to deliver the work that you do. Yeah. Unless you go out of your way to seek additional opportunities, mm -hmm. which in some of my cases I did, and said the initiatives that I'm running, Recultural Health and Social Innovation, mm -hmm. Africa Pharma Network, with some of my colleagues, mm -hmm. it's out of personal initiative. Yeah. But at the same time, even in doing them, you don't get the support the to make support it pick ground need. and actually yeah. deliver the impact that you're hoping for. Mm -hmm. So how then do you make it? Mm -hmm. It means even now when you're looking at it now, just reflecting on that, somebody would see Nelly Chiboy's story and be like, well, I have to I go out of to. the country yes. to do it. To, to get to get to get this opportunity. But we can do it locally. Yeah. There's hope possibilities. Why don't we do it? Mm -hmm. It's about giving us the platform. And as young people, we have the ability to do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, is the government going to commit and work with young people to make that possibility realized? Mm -hmm. And once we know that we are going to realize it here, mm -hmm. then most young people will be able to come up with their innovative and creative ideas mm -hmm. with a focus on helping the country achieve its aspirations. Okay. And in so doing, they're also making a better life for themselves and their communities. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Cinnamon, you want to contribute to the same? Um, I think I just also, this is a very powerful story. And I think I, my, we are really proud as a, uh, as a country. Absolutely. Absolutely. of what Nelly has able to achieve so far. Like what, uh, what my associates have said, mm -hmm. it's really important that we start this conversation. And I think her winning this award offers that springboard mm -hmm. to have these conversations and just empower the youth in, uh, like, um, in terms of uh, supporting them financially, mm -hmm. not even su not as a financial. I think even when we were growing up, we had this notion where probably you wanted to get into computer stuff or yes. just music, something artsy, yeah? yeah. But you weren't getting that support from your system within home. But uh, we definitely need so to have this con Yeah, <laughs> 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 precisely. I think it all starts at that basic level where uh, as parents, as the caregivers of the young youth, probably motivate them in mm -hmm. getting into mm -hmm. something they are really passionate about. Mm -hmm. And I think when we have to start leveraging on that, we yeah. can definitely get more support in mm -hmm. uh, supporting innovative solutions and the whole bit of digital yeah. solutions, offering digital solutions in this era of digital age. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And of course, I mean, young people are very creative. Mm -hmm. um, we can we cannot underscore that. Young people are very creative, so the only thing they want is that support, support. you know? Yes. Support is, is, is all we need. All right, um, and uh, elsewhere, let's take a look at what, um, you know, the Daily Nation still offers. So the backstory of Ryla's loss in presidential race, and of course, there's a lot of blame game, um, you know, which is happening in the camp. And things are not rosy in Odinga's Azmiolo Moja coalition. And of course, like I said, our very own Kennedy Murray, they ran a very um, you know, comprehensive uh, feature yesterday. But of course, you can find that on our YouTube page as well as our website. Um, you know, get to understand the ins and outs and how, you know, this happened. But again, um, you know, there's a question of, um, you know, then came the question of whether Azmio had agents in all polling stations following claims of theft of votes. And again, I mean, so many other things that came out from 
from the same. Um, you know, there was a lot of blame game here and there. The agents were not there. The agents were not paid. We did not have agents. It was a lot of things. All right. So again, to get more on the same, uh, Mr. Saitabao Ole Kanchori uh, actually said, all right, and one of the things that he said is, if I was having a drink, I would not want to have it with anyone else other than Professor Makao Mutua, all right? And get to understand why did he say that, okay? That was very highlighted, I mean, on Kennedy Murethi's feature, which, like I said, you might want to go to our website uh, or our YouTube channel and, of course, get to understand more on the ins and outs. But at the same time, I Dinga actually said that those who dined and wined with us have abandoned us all right and of course she says um you know um she's she's spoken about the betrayal her family has suffered following the defeat in the presidential election she has accused some politicians from the nyanza region of fighting her family and orchestrating the downfall and let me just quote what she said she said the same politicians would wake up and come to my home for breakfast lunch and supper and spend the whole day at my office right they are now uh, insulting members of my family, forgetting that they used to be to frequent uh, my home, pretending to be close to the family. And of course, she also accused the politicians of abandoning her family. The politicians, um, she said, were involved in campaigns to push for Mr. Odinga to retire from politics instead of, um, you know, supporting them. And that is a question of stabbing, <laughs> stab being stabbed, uh, you know, at, at, at the back. So again, like they say, politics, Politics the politics, you know? <laughs> like we've been told over and over again. So that you can you can cough it up, um, you know, and all those things. So of course that story is on the Daily Nation. Make sure that you grab um, you know a copy of the same and um, learn about more on um, you know the whole aspect of betrayal as I Dinga says. So we're taking a break, but of course when we come back, we'll quickly run through the standard type Leo. We have business daily, um, you know, as well as the star just to see what's on the head. But remember, uh, we also have a conversation on the universal health coverage. Remember, like we said, the 12th of December. Again, we celebrate Jamahui Day here in the country, but of course, across the globe, we mark the universal health uh, coverage day. Of course, today we want to focus on the future of medicine. I'm happy that the panel is comprised of young persons, all right? So what do they see as far as the future of medicine is concerned? And what is their role, okay? Because majority of the times, to Nambonga, see young people, we are the leaders of tomorrow, okay? So does that apply to them as well? And how, uh, or what are some of the contributions that they can make as far as the achievement of the universal health coverage? All that is coming up after the break. Stay with us. This is AM. On my dark marks, I've tried everything from A to Z, even vitamin C, but hardly any results. Nivea Lumina 630 works from day one with visible results in just two weeks and 71% dark marks reduction in 12. Join the 1 million women already using the number one Lumina 630 from Nivea. Up to 60 million shillings worth of prizes to be won with daily and weekly cash prizes to be won by over 3 million Kenyans. Watch, create, upload, Buy a daily YouTube bundle or create a YouTube short with the hashtag shorter is better and stand a chance to win. Dial star 544 hash to get your one gigabyte bundle for just 10 shillings. My name is Norman Udipo, former NTV business anchor and also a reporter, currently a communications consultant with App Exporter Novelli. As among the few who are privileged to attend the Man Cave, which was sponsored and led by Nation Media Group, um, I think for me it was the first ever, the real first ever men's conference. And I know there's been all this talk around men not talking, but I think for me that needs to change because men talked. Maybe not everyone, but men talk. 
And I just want to encourage men to talk because that's how you're going to cope with the stresses, with the challenges of life. The same way like the women do. So I think for me it was an eye-opener, it was a watershed moment and looking forward to more conversations, more sharing of experiences in February 2023. And the pillows is catastrophe, Iguana. Ni Papa Charles Papa. At his house, June Christmas, Mumma has a kupanga panga ma food fight. Yani vita na chakula. Simuni alikego tuta kika mocha ni panu mudomo watu wa ni tuange na chapati za pinda za pa kwa mudomo yani aish. Iko jita hii Christmas. To get Christmas food fight by Papa Jasper, dial star 812 star 805 hash. Skiza. Nan Nation. Tell me, what is it? I thought everything was ready. The wedding, the honeymoon, what else did we miss? Where we're going to live, for example. Oh. I spoke to your mother, but I don't want to be a bother to her. I really don't want to live in someone else's home. Maybe for a while, but not forever. And well, I don't see any interest in your part for us to live on our own. Lorenzo, please, don't be childish. I am just telling you that I'm aware it was you who actually ruined all no, my no, dates. No, 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 that's not true. I saved you from adultery, and this is work-related. So how do I look? Don't you think I look so debonair? Yes. Yes, so debonair. From the 50s. It had to be you. Crystal Rivers Residences. The future of fine living. This December on NTV Investigates. We expose the rot in Kenya's coffee sector and how business executives have been smiling all the way to the bank as farmers languish in poverty. You are a slave of somebody who makes money. Where we had said marketing agents will stop here, the minister went and extended their term for one year and the attorney general then told him no, this is irregular and illegal. The right to own property. It is anchored in our constitution that nobody should take that without due compensation. Was it self-sabotage against government-initiated reforms in the coffee industry? Black Gold Heist with NTV's Ibrahim Karanja, only on NTV. Just 17 months ago, Spain made a run to the semi-finals at Euro 2020, heightening expectations ahead of the 2022 World Cup. That Spain failed to meet those expectations has brought disappointment and the exit of manager Luis Enrique. Just 17 months ago, that seemed so unlikely, but alas, is now the reality. Go is about thriving, reaching for the stars. It's about exploring new ideas, securely and safely, from the palm of your hands. It's go time with M Pesa Go. Welcome back. Uh, glad you're still with us. Of course, the show is AM Live. And today, like we said, on the show, we'll be discussing universal health coverage and, of course, the whole concept, uh, concept on the future of medicine. And I can say someone on Twitter very quickly says, I hope the government of Kenya invests in preventive health, empowering PHOs and CH CHAs. Uh, to realize UHC. Well, there's a number of S's and S's and C's uh, over there, but of course we'll be looking at it <laughs> uh, as we continue with, uh, with the conversation. But very quickly, before we delve into the conversation, 
Um, before we talk about the standards, something that I want to hear from you, and this is as far as the DN2 is concerned, it's not here on the e-paper, uh, says the injectable ARVs show promise in the Kenya trial, and researchers have actually shown optimism about the performance of injectable antiretroviral drugs that were introduced for clinical trials in the country six months ago. And according to the researchers, the trial whose purpose was to determine whether this injection can do as well as uh, the tablets in controlling the HIV virus so far is satisfactory. Factory. What do you guys um, make of this? Let me start with you, uh, the only gent. <laughs> <laughs> Even as we wait for for one more, what do you what do you make of of this? Um, and you know, and especially I'm curious in terms of how soon we'll see you know full rollout of this. In. But the fact that you know the trial is promising, what do you think? Um, you know, how will this help? Uh, because this this whole aspect about fatigue, you know, when it yeah. comes to taking the drug. So, what do you make of this? So it's a good advancement and the goodness is from medical practice, mm -hmm. it's about following the evidence. All right. And the clinical trials as a way of generating that evidence and confirming by the way, this product can work in this population and when we look at it in terms from a pharmacy per standpoint, mm -hmm. we use medicines and the convenience of the patient. It's mm -hmm. not about me as a pharmacist using the medicines. True. I'm treating a patient. Is the patient convenient taking one medication one day at a mm -hmm. time or twice a day? Mm -hmm. Or do they want an injection that could take, say for example, a week or a month of use? Mm -hmm. So if that convenience is integrated in the design and actually mm -hmm. the formulation of that product that is being brought into the market, mm -hmm. then that is a win for us because we want patients to be able to get their medication. Let's say, for example, it's a once a monthly injection, mm -hmm. then that patient will go do their thing. Yeah. Instead of having to remember, imagine if for this morning that we are here, mm -hmm. if I was to take my medication and I forgot, yeah. it means after the interview, I'll have to rush home, get my medication, medication. and then go to work. Yeah. How much inconvenience is that? Yeah. And those are the kind of dynamics. And I think with the evidence that is coming up, it's about us now looking at mm -hmm. how do we make it accessible past the clinical trials? Because mm -hmm. it would be good there's evidence supporting it, there's every support for what it needs mm -hmm. to do from a scientific standpoint. Mm -hmm. But if the patient doesn't get the medication, of what use is it? Yeah. It's like you're having a show, let's say, for example, in TV broadcasting all the information mm -hmm. and nobody's watching. True. The information needs to get to the, to people. the people. And how does it yeah. get to the people? Mm -hmm. By people being able to consume it. So from the medical standpoint, having the medicines which are effective and actually re required by the patients and having patients use them mm -hmm. so that they are able to achieve the positive health outcomes that we're hoping for. They get well. Mm -hmm. If they were not sick, then if it's a wellness product, they're able to stay healthy and thrive in whatever they're doing. At the same time. Yeah. Um, and of course, this, again, in my opinion, so we help. Remember, we had, was it last year or the year before, the whole question about the shortage, um, you know, of, of, of yeah, drugs. So many people are not able to access it, yeah. um, you know, at the same time. So, you know, to what magnitude do you think this will help? Well, I can say HIV has really burdened uh, the health system and just the uh, outcome of patients has been very poor. Mm -hmm. And I remember we did a research uh, with colleagues of mine mm -hmm. in Karatina Subcounty Hospital where we were talking about factors affecting adherence to antiretroviral therapy. And what came out is the pill burden. Um, mm -hmm. The pills uh, patients have to take, yeah. uh, people living with HIV are so many. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it, it, it becomes a hindrance on them adhering to treatment and eventually reducing viral load and all those things. Yeah. So this injectable ARVs comes as a good thing mm -hmm. uh, in terms of reducing that and enabling patients to stick to the remedy yeah. and trying to, like you said, uh, live a very healthy life. Mm -hmm. But we also say we are driven by data and mm -hmm. research that is there. Yeah. So we, we want to put that in that context and make it work for people living with HIV in that, if that will help in you know, adhering, them to, adhering to treatment and producing a healthy outcome for Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Yeah. And then, of course, there's a whole question about stigma. And, and one would think, listen, we're in 2022. We should not be yeah. stigmatizing yeah. anybody, um, you know, on, on anything, mm -hmm. you know? But at the same time, the reality on the ground is stigma is still a very big issue. So again, do you think this will help with the same? Just go to hospital, get your injection, and you're good to go. Nobody has to know. You do not have to carry your medication, uh, you know, around with you. Or forget <laughs> to take your medication. I mean, stigma is always the elephant in the room for anyone suffering yeah. from any condition. Mm -hmm. And there are very many um, heads to, to, to look at from, if you're looking at it. Mm -hmm. I always say for stigma, you look at it from the reflection of the person looking in the mirror, so right. not from what you see. Mm -hmm. So from your view, you don't see it as a problem, but mm -hmm. to the person who's probably the perpetrator of stigma, or who is judging you for going to pick your medication, yeah. or who is a little bit harsh for you taking coming to work late because you have to pass by the clinic to pick your medications, your medication, yeah. you have to understand from their standpoint mm -hmm. why that's why 
the, the notions of why they're behaving in that particular way. Mm -hmm. And that can only come through, and essentially most health changes can only come through mm -hmm. leadership and governance. Mm -hmm. Is our leadership doing enough to ensure that everyone understands the various moving parts in a health system? Mm -hmm. That even though we have a clinical trial that's ongoing that's saying there are good results, right. as a Kenyan government, what mm -hmm. measures do we have in place mm -hmm. that our people can get this medication? Mm -hmm. Because clinical trials will always be there and advances in medicine will always be there. Mm -hmm. But if our people cannot access medications that make their life more convenient, mm. then essentially they don't thrive at work. Okay. And coincidentally, the UK government does have a report called Thriving at Work, right. how if you give people the environment, and it's simple things, mm -hmm. to be able to do the job at optimum, the country's GDP increases. Mm. So I think for me, this is a big question of what leadership and government strategies do we have in place mm -hmm. to ensure that our country is wealthy enough, courtesy mm -hmm. of the health of the people. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Prioritize health um, is, is basically what we're saying. All right, uh, Ngalula is here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for making time for us. Ngalula yeah. Donald, Chair, Kenya Students and Nova is Nurses. Thank you so much for coming by today. We're talking about the injectable ARVs, um, which again has shown promise especially um, you know here in the country so I'm just curious to hear very quickly your view on the same um, remember when when uh, the vaccine came into the country right uh, and a number of Kenyans we were hesitant to go take it first of all until we saw the president <laughs> taking the vaccine is where almost everybody uh, you know rushed to get um, their vaccine so I, I don't know what your view is as far as this injectable is concerned I know it's still in the trial um, face especially here in the country we've not rolled out uh, completely but what what do you make of the same uh, thank you very much for having us uh, in the show. And uh, I want to say that um, that is a, it's quite a welcome mm -hmm. and it's already, it's time it's, it's due. Mm -hmm. Because uh, what we see, I've worked in HIV mm -hmm. for three months between May and August this year. Right. And stigma towards people who are taking ARVs right, yeah. is still on high mm -hmm. uh, 30 years later mm -hmm. after the first case of HIV mm -hmm. was uh, announced in the country. Yeah. And um, if we can be able to have a way in which people living with HIV AIDS are able to take their medication mm -hmm. without having to hide their status mm -hmm. or being uh, behaving to be in a more acceptable manner in the society, mm -hmm. then it's a welcome. Okay, all right. And, and we wait to see more results from the trial before, again, this is rolled out. Okay, very quickly, um, you know, on to what the standard has, and we're just going to go through the headlines. Uh, so the standard says, hit and misses of Ruto's 90 days, and of course, from the celebrations that we witnessed yesterday, the president used Jamhui Day podium to give a scorecard of his administration promising to do more, but a number of his campaign pledges are yet to be met 10 days to their deadline, all right? And of course, among the promises, as far as Jamuhuri promises, um, and, and this is what he actually said yesterday. So he said, the government will actually build a 100,000 kilometer digital superhighway to allow internet, uh, internet access to homes, cities, towns, and every part of the country. Uh, number two, transfer 85%, about 5,000 services of remaining government services to the digital space in the next six months, deliver fertilizer subsidy to 1.3 million farmers through the e-voucher, to eliminate brokers and cartels. And he continues to say, actualize the dream of the home ownership by delivering housing units with monthly installments of between 2,500 and 10,000 shillings and Kenya industrial estates to provide coaching and mentorship to 100,000 entrepreneurs. Uh, confer citizenship to the Pemba leave, uh, people living in Kilifi County and the process has already started. And of course, we read that story earlier on. And then partner with the Nairobi County to recruit at least 11,000 youth to grow a minimum of 1.5 million trees in the city's um, open and public spaces and chiefs to rally people to grow 3,000 trees weekly as well as rebuild and monetize sports and creatives industry through the Talanta Hela plan all right so those are some of the things but of course go through the dailies to you know see uh, more on the same and then very quickly so that is the daily nation that this is the east african very quickly on uh, what taifa leo says vitamu Viaja, okay and of course this is as far as the president's promises and some of the things that we actually gone through right here on uh the standard um you know what has said and of course it was like sort of like an 11 um you know 
agenda promised. Um, so I'm not going to go through the same because it's what we have actually gone through as far as the standard is concerned. And then Kenya's best and worst paying sectors has been revealed. This is this should be a very interesting read, all right? And just to see uh, your, the sector where you are at. <laughs> Do you feel it's, it's one of the, the best paying or not? But again, the financial services has the highest share of top earners, only 3.3% uh, of workers in mining, quarry, and 100,000 shillings. So uh, where are you at? <laughs> and do you think the sector that you are in is among the best or the worst paying sector? Because majority of the times, and I'm sure you've had a lot of people say, um, Mimi natafta, natafta, inesho nini, ili kona pesa mingi, eh, ili eneza lipa, so <laughs> where you are at. You know, most of us used to say, mandaktari wanalipu wa sana, muna lipo pesa mingi sana. <laughs> Do you think your sector is the most high paying now? No, it's a it's scam. A scam. It's a scam. It's a scam. <laughs> But why? Because when we were younger, eh, our parents used to tell us, Usome ukwe daktari. Like it still is considered, you know, one of the prestigious, uh, you know, jobs. I was just kidding. Anyway, so uh, the East African, uh, very quickly on the headline says, Dear Congo, and of course, more sanctions and blame. And the European Union goes uh, for eight people. Uh, it terms warmonger as well. The U.S. criticized this neighboring country over alleged continual support of M23 rebels. And of course, that story is on pages four and five. So grab yourself a copy of the East African, or better yet, go to our website, and that is the nation, um, you know, e-paper, and get access to all this, the business daily, Taifa Leo, daily nation, East African, seas of gold, it's a lot, all right, and go through the papers and see uh, what that is all about. But let's switch gears and talk about the conversation of the day. That is as far as universal health coverage is concerned. Remember, we celebrated or the world marked the day yesterday. Uh, together with Jamohuri Day here in the country, but we also celebrated, uh, you know, the universal health coverage. And of course, today we want to focus on the future of medicine. My panel is comprised of young people, so it's a good thing, all right? It's a good thing to see, and especially as far as their contribution is concerned. So very quickly, just in case you're joining in right now, Dr. Marie Claire uh, Wangari, who's a convener, Kenya Medical Association, Young Doctors Network, Cinnamon Nyagaka, Chair, Kenya Healthcare Student Summit. Uh, we have Ngalula Donald, Chair. Kenya students and novice nurses, as well as Dr. David Odhiambo, Chair, Young Pharmacists Group, Pharmaceutical Society of Kenya. I chair, 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 chair. It's all good. <laughs> but before we talk about or we delve deeper into the conversation, let's first of all get to understand what universal health coverage is. And of course, if we can have the graphics on, because according to the World Health Organization, let me just get that. So according to the WHO, we have the graphics just to help you really understand more about what universal health coverage is. So the big question is, what exactly is universal health coverage, all right? So the WHO says this is a world where everyone, everywhere, all right, mark those two words, everyone, everywhere, can access healthcare without facing financial hardship, all right? That is what the WHO terms as universal health coverage. But in as much as we're saying everyone and everywhere can actually access, they're very grooming, um, you know, statistics if we can say from the WHO and one of the things is the 30 percent of the world's population still cannot access essential health services and again it is in 2022 okay why is that the case we'll be answering that and then uh, almost 2 billion people are facing catastrophic or impoverishing health spending that is the out uh, you know of pocket expenditure and as well as um, inequalities continue to be a fundamental challenge for universal health coverage and the COVID-19 pandemic further disrupted essential services in 92 percent of countries and again we saw this in the country again um, the weak health system was largely exposed um, during COVID-19 so um, I'm gonna start with you Ngalula because you came in last i don't want to say late <laughs> you made it you made it all right so what do you make what do you make of this of this uh statement first of all that everybody everywhere should be able to access but then again 30 percent i mean of the world's population are not able to access what do you make of this um thank you very much mm -hmm. well as you know that uh, health is a fundamental human right yeah. and um every human being no matter where he or she is mm -hmm. has a right to access um quality healthcare yeah. uh, services. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, surprisingly, well, the data we are, we are reading that 30% mm -hmm. are, or rather billions of people are still not able to access mm -hmm. uh, healthcare. It points out to uh, 
the country's uh, not really, uh, the uni uh, universal investment in healthcare. All right. How are we investing in healthcare to make it more accessible? And when you're talking about accessibility of healthcare, mm -hmm. are we able to, are we investing in the elements that make healthcare accessible, that is including uh, investing in healthcare workers and investing in the healthcare infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Because that is how we make healthcare accessible. Yeah. And secondly, are we investing in primary health care? Mm -hmm. Because primary health care is the thing. cornerstone of universal, universal health care. Absolutely. All right. So we should invest more in, on, on primary health care. And very quickly, if someone is, is watching us and thinking, so primary mm -hmm. <laughs> health care, what exactly does that mean? Let's go through it quickly and why it is so important to invest in the same, um, you know, for us to achieve the, the universal health coverage. I mean, let's start off with how our health system is currently yeah. is mostly pegged on curative care. Yeah. So that means when you fall sick, you go to the hospital, you get treatment, mm -hmm. you go home. Yeah. But ideally, a health system should be when you fall sick, you go get health services. Mm -hmm. But also when you need to get your annual checkup, we're a few days to the close of the year, mm -hmm. you should be able to go and get your annual checkup and know probably what risks you might be at. Probably during the year, you were, your blood pressures were borderline high and you yeah. were told to do some lifestyle modifications. Mm -hmm. If you don't focus on that, and probably if you get into the rat race of fighting uh, the common battle of poverty, mm -hmm. um, you'll end up in hypertension and then that's another rat race you have to run and yeah. battle against. Mm -hmm. So there is that preventive approach that we really haven't gotten uh, correct. Respect, and yeah. preventive approach mm -hmm. does not mean that if I need to go get my routine blood pressures checked in, let's say, my village, um, I'm rushing to KNH mm -hmm. to go get my routine blood pressures checked. Mm -hmm. That's overloading Kenyatta National Hospital for nothing. We should have you should, I should yeah. be able to go to the facility that's closest to me to have those pressures checked in the right. event that I cannot afford a blood pressure machine. Mm -hmm. And that is the element of primary health care. Right. And primary health care needs, I mean, level one is community. Mm -hmm. So it needs the community to be well equipped to be able to deal with any health challenges that they see. Mm -hmm. I'm sure pretty a number of times when you have a health, something that's coming up, mm -hmm. before you end up in front of a doctor's desk, you've discussed it with someone, yes. many a times not even a healthcare practitioner, no. and then they tell you, if it's a cold, they tell you, ah, it's, it's just take dawa, you'll be fine. We're take doctor's boss, yeah. so like doctor's I mean, quote yeah, and quote. Yeah, your doctor's <laughs> quote <laughs> and quote. I mean, yeah, we have yes. very many doctors quote and quote, mm -hmm. but, very few, but very few are mm -hmm. actually given that mandate to practice. Yeah. And the problem is, even at primary healthcare level, where we are saying probably is where we have the solution, mm -hmm. because rightly said, and even it was highlighted in the Kenya Kwanzaa Manifesto, yeah. one shilling in investment in preventive healthcare gives you almost nine shillings in return. Okay. So it's already, it's already making financial sense, sense on yeah. the papers. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have people, yeah, but yeah. if you don't have the people in that community health facility, mm -hmm. if I go and I find that facility is more of a glorified building with a signpost on it, mm -hmm. then we'll end up in a scenario where you're overloading the facilities that should technically not be dealing with those issues right. when, and then you end up saying, we went to the hospital for the full day and we didn't get the health services that we needed. Absolutely. So. And one of the things that people complain about is the long waiting times. Maybe in Menda Subui, like in Metibua Satisa, and yet we should get some of these services, like you're saying, um, you know, at, at our closest uh, health facility. But now there's a question about, and, and you mentioned it very quickly, and, and Sinamon, I wanted to hear your, your view on the same, and that is our health seeking behavior. All right. <laughs> if it does not hurt, <laughs> we are not going to hospital. All right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and do you think our health seeking behavior, like forget the government, forget the, the mm. you know, healthcare pr practitioners, forget the hospitals and, and facilities and all those things. We as a people, do you think our health seeking behavior is a big impediment towards the achievement of UHC? When we're talking about the health sector, the largest stakeholders when it comes to it are the individuals themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, the, they're, the, they're the common stakeholders and they are the largest stakeholders in coming to the health sector. Mm -hmm. And where it all draws down to us when we are seeking health services from mm -hmm. uh, hospitals and whether, you, 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 let's say for example, uh, I'm just giving a very local example. Okay. Uh, let's have a man and a woman here. Right. Uh, you have a flu, yeah, or just... Uh, so a flu is the basic thing, yeah? Okay. So uh, someone will just play it out, mostly the males will just play it out, but a woman can be 
get to think like, okay, this can be just more than a flu. I have more, probably an infection, yeah? Uh, so females are more tender, are, are more inclined to seek yeah. health, oh, and yeah. especially the, the, the setup that you're in, mm -hmm. uh, discussing it among themselves. But we, if we don't take charge of our own health and probably be uh, st stand accountable for what we are vouching for, mm -hmm. we have a problem in achieving universal health coverage. Yeah, right. And uh, also in terms of our own education, uh, how familiar we are with a certain disease or condition or even the current health system that it is, mm -hmm. we are entitled and we should be very educated on what we are supposed to do as individuals in terms of accountability and putting the the people, the policy makers, the lead, our leaders mm -hmm. to put them accountable of what they're supposed to do in the health sector. Right. That goes to healthcare financing, uh, goes to policies, we, sh we, sh we should be definitely be educated mm -hmm. in that sector. Yeah. But in terms of our health seeking be behavior, we, are, mm -hmm. we still have a long way to go yeah. uh, in terms of uh, reaching out and seeking out the help that we need mm -hmm. in, from the various health uh, institutions. Um, and, and you know, yeah. majority of the times, uh, Dr. Dr. Udiambo, is the whole question about, we have, we have our very own pharmacy at home. Eh? Mm. <laughs> and every time you have a flu or, a flu or whatever it is that you have, it's, it's easy for us to go reach out to the medicine. Ile to cabinet, ile totally to me last, last year. Yeah. Okay, you don't know, but you need to idea, right? So again, that, that goes down to our health seeking um, behavior and how much of an impediment this is up towards the, the uni achievement of the universal mm. health coverage. So what do you have to say to this? And especially from you know, a pharmaceutical uh, perspective. From a pharmaceutical angle, mm -hmm. what the first thing is about our self-seeking behavior, yeah. it's not right. Yeah. And the reason we're in trouble. We, we're in trouble, yeah, yeah. that's a fact. Mm -hmm. And we have to understand why is it that most of us, when, when we are unwell, we are not seeking out care. Mm -hmm. And when we're not seeking out care, it's about being unwell. And actually, mm -hmm. at this point, I'm reminded of a friend of mine mm -hmm. running Planet Wizard, kind of a media talking on health. He's a pharmacist as well. Right. And he's talking at our healthcare system. It's not healthcare, it's sick care. Because mm -hmm. you wait to seek care when you are sick, when you're sick. not yeah. when you're healthy. Mm -hmm. So, how do we change that health seeking behavior? It's yeah. about us, first of all, from a promotive and preventive aspect. Aspect. Mm -hmm. Do you have the right information to make the high, right health decisions, right. the right life choices, mm -hmm. so that you're able to stay healthy? If you're not able to, then you're able to access the facilities that are available for you. Are they mm -hmm. available? Are they accessible? Mm -hmm. And then are you affordability. Right. But when you look at that from a pharmacy standpoint, is one, people don't consider pharmacies as healthcare facilities. Mm -hmm. And that is something that's changing. All right. Even now when Mary Claire mentioned the aspect mm -hmm. that you need to go to Kenyatta to have your blood pressure checked, mm -hmm. so people would look at it from, I need to go to a primary healthcare center, the government facilities, or mm -hmm. a clinic somewhere. Mm -hmm. Almost every pharmacy that I've visited over the last couple of years, five mm -hmm. or so, mm -hmm. have a BP machine, and they have glucometers, they can test your blood pressure and actually assess your blood sugar levels. Mm -hmm. Are you considering them as primary healthcare facilities? Yeah, right. Because oftentimes, so even when you're walking home, just mm -hmm. next to the corner, you find a pharmacy, yeah, you're yes, not yes. using them. Yeah. Then at your home now, you've actually had your own pharmacy, that's the same example that you're mentioning, mm -hmm. and you're using, using and using medicines mm -hmm. that might not be effective for you. And last, last month, we were looking at World Antimicrobial Awareness Week. Yeah. How many antibiotics are you overusing mm -hmm. or underusing or irrationally using? Yeah. You used this amoxicillin last year, mm -hmm. you left it there, probably it's expired, mm -hmm. or you even stored it in the wrong conditions, mm -hmm. therefore it has gone, grown some mold, it's not effective anymore, mm -hmm. but you're still using it. Okay. The bacteria will get used to that, it's not going to kill us, mm -hmm. so we de de develop our own defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. We're also exposing ourselves to more harm. Yeah. And over time, we get to a point where we're just having medicines for the placebo effect. Mm -hmm. It's like you're drinking water to treat you. What I want, mm -hmm. but from a psychological standpoint, you think, by the way, I've been cured, you, yeah. but you're not being cured. All so right. over time, you now have infection that are becoming consistent. Actually, you're suffering more because mm -hmm. you're not seeking the care you need to seek, mm -hmm. but rather you are hoping that you're treating yourself, and that is harming us. Yeah. So the other bit also, we need to look at what are the drivers as to why we are not seeking care when we need it. Mm -hmm. Dynamics of a country, mm -hmm. you talked about how economic stations are. If I have to go work to feed my family, will I go to a hospital, spend a whole day, and probably live without medication? Mm -hmm. Definitely not. Yeah. Because those people look out for me mm -hmm. to provide for them. So yeah. if those are not addressed, then why would I go to a hospital? Mm -hmm. And the other bit, I'm going to a hospital where I'm sure I'm not going to see a doctor. Okay. So why would I go? All right. So are they available? 
Okay. Then access. Yeah. All right. And then, of course, the whole question about um, finances. Most people will tell you, eh, mini endo hospitali, I'll spend this, um, you know, amount of money. Like the <laughs> whole aspect of, you know, yeah. balancing, um, you know, the same uh, health-seeking behavior, but at the same time, affordability. Um, like we talked about the question about accessibility. But again, so is it time then we look beyond our health-seeking behavior mm -hmm. and, and really focus on why is it that people are not seeking help? Yeah. Because we are not, uh, I don't want to sit here and think, I'm trying to home, going to a bit, like, you just don't want to go to hospital simply because <laughs> wanogopa, <laughs> wanogopa medication. <laughs> Is it time we look deeper yeah. into getting to really understand why mm -hmm. um, and we're seeking help and especially towards the preventive um, aspect? I think he has, uh, Dr. David has really spoken on what most households do. Yeah. I don't want to put my family here on the line. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. We all, we're all we are watching at all. It's okay. <laughs> um, Case example, yeah. I, I know my dad is watching me here yes. now. Hi. And um, <laughs> uh, he's really passionate about sorry, self-medication. Yes. But also about that, what brings about the issue of self-medication? Mm -hmm. Is it that our health institutions are not, are, are not providing that effective and uh, affordable health care? So mm -hmm. someone just resorts to just going, buying the drugs. We mm -hmm. know like, if I have a flu, I'll go for cetrizine or just flu gone, yeah? yeah. Uh, if I have probably a sore throat, uh, I know it's a, I'll assume it's a uh, infection. Yeah. Uh, I'll just go for an antibiotic or just steroid there. Yeah. So probably it points out the gaps uh, that there, there is in terms of uh, service delivery, probably, mm -hmm. and also uh, in term, uh, maybe the healthcare workforce, which mm -hmm. is we will talk about yeah, it. We'll talk about, yes. Yeah, we'll talk about it. Yeah, about probably how are, are they not providing the, 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 the health care that is supposed to be given to uh, the community. Mm. So uh, it, it definitely, especially when it comes to preventive care, and I think Dr. MC talked about it, mm -hmm. uh, we, are, we are really pegged on talking about uh, solving cr uh, crises we're not really based focusing mm -hmm. on the promotive so like and preventive creation, yes yeah? okay. so we are just focusing sana on the let me give it for non-communicable diseases which are very which is a high burden on our yeah. health systems currently mm -hmm. talking about diabetes we are not giving the proper education from the word go on how you're supposed to maintain that lifestyle mm -hmm. uh to maintain a healthy lifestyle to pre prevent you from getting that disease yeah. so we are really uh, financing and really focusing on just the treatment mm. uh, on the curative bit and focus uh, uh, f uh, forgetting about the preventive uh, promotive and rehabilitation aspect of this aspect yeah. of it which is mostly about primary health care I think we have highlighted that we in order to achieve UHC we really need to strengthen our primary, primary health care systems yeah. in order to achieve yeah. what we want to do and 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 dr. Marie do people then know because again like we're saying health yeah. is a right right yeah. we all have a right to um, you know access affordable and quality health care but do do people really know that like it's, it is it is my right <laughs> to yeah. access health care so that if my um if like a facility near my place does not have the the for example equipment or resources human resources um, you know at that mm -hmm. i have a right to actually ask questions like why because at the end of the day i have that right to uh, access quality health care so do do we know <laughs> so i'll answer it in two ways okay um, I think the first thing, and I'll just piggyback on the health-seeking behavior. All right. I think as a nation and as a people, we need to embrace the context of um, health is our wealth All right. and wealth is our health. True. So the same way when your salary comes in at the end of the month and you mm -hmm. put it in the bank account mm -hmm. diligently and you probably save in a circle, yeah. you should also invest in your health, All right. whether you're sick or not. Or not. Okay. That's the first thing we need to, to get out of the way. All right. Um, and the second other thing, which to me, I believe if all things, for me, my main message is leadership and governance mm -hmm. is a key thing. Mm -hmm. All we are talking about here, um, health systems have its building blocks. Sure. Leadership and governance is one, is of, one them. of them. Yeah. And if you're looking at, let's go at, let's say, the primary health care level, mm -hmm. I mean, we have our devolved government, we have our devolved health systems, mm -hmm. but do you know the person in the community actually does have a role in managing the health care of that community facility that is there right. through being in the health committee? Mm -hmm. There's a role for the community to give feedback. Okay. But many a times, as Monainchi, you will probably give more feedback to a private institution because you yes. have been let down so many times by mm. the public or institution. They have about or, or, <laughs> or, 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 or you've seen something saying doctors are not there and doctors yes. are there. Yeah. So you already have this biased, mm -hmm. negativity bias 
that public systems don't work. Okay. You have it already fixed in you. Mm -hmm. So you'll go to look for this extra revenue to get better care and probably overload one, one cascade of the health system. Okay. Whereas our public systems actually do work. Mm -hmm. There are people who have been diagnosed with, let's say, breast cancer, mm -hmm. who through NHIF have gotten their treatments True. in public facilities mm -hmm. without going out of the country. Yeah. Look at COVID, for example. Mm -hmm. A lot of the health uh, tourism that used to go out mm -hmm. had to stay home yeah. because now there are no flights to go to India or any other country for advanced care. All right. That in itself has already shown us that we need to invest in home. We need to invest in our health systems. Mm -hmm. And that starts with also you trusting mm -hmm. the facility that is closest to you. Right. Because the moment we start trusting those facilities and being accountable and giving feedback, mm -hmm. That's when the systems change. Right. Otherwise, we'll still be overloading the system and mm -hmm. still complaining that I wanted to take one hour in the hospital mm -hmm. and I took a whole day. Okay. All right. Um, the whole question about trusting and, and, and people going outside, <laughs> uh, you know, to get to get help. Um, majority of the, of the times, people would be like, but we do not have the services. My doctor is Kenya. How easy treat, quote unquote, right? And, and this is not the reality on the ground. It's just that, that con misconception that we have, right? Yeah. That we cannot get the services here in the country. We need to go, you know, outside the country. So this whole aspect about trusting, um, you know, our, our healthcare workforce. Why? Why, Kodini, we don't trust you? <laughs> <laughs> and how do we break that? So that, again, instead of spending a lot of money, you know, going outside the country for services that we can literally get um, you know, here in the country and in public um, you know, health facility as, as well. How, how do we bridge that gap? Well, uh, about trust, yeah, mm -hmm. it's quite a subjective mm -hmm. uh, issue about right. uh, the public. All right. But uh, one thing I may want to point out is that um, we have one of the best public uh, health care systems in Kenya. Do we? Yes. Okay. Uh, probably the reason why we are having trust issues are, are, are pegged on history okay. of what happened previously when right. the healthcare system had not been well mm -hmm. invested in, mm -hmm. different from what we are having today. Mm -hmm. Today, if you go to uh, MTRH, mm -hmm. which I, I always prefer as the best pu uh, public hospital that we have around, All right. uh, KU came in the other day. Mm -hmm. We, as pu uh, the public, need to visit more of our public mm -hmm. facilities, okay. get services more from our public facilities. Mm -hmm. We've seen how our, our own surgeons have ended up um, uh, doing uh, groundbreaking surgeries mm -hmm. True. Uh, at a record, mm -hmm. not in private facilities, but in our public facilities. All right. So our public facilities are capable right. and able. Okay. We as the public need to just put them into, uh, uh, put them into account, mm -hmm. put our leaders uh, to account mm -hmm. when the system is failing. Okay. Because when the system is failing, it's not the healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. Healthcare workers are just but a component mm -hmm. of the entire of system. The entire system. Yeah. So when we see gaps, let us approach it in terms of a system. Which are these components that should enable healthcare workers mm -hmm. to thrive? Okay. Because if healthcare workers thrive, then the system mm -hmm. is thriving. They are the drivers of the system. Mm -hmm. So if they thrive, then the entire system as well. All right, how about we take a break, but when we come back, I mean, I think it's one of the things that uh, Dr. Marie pointed out. One time you visit a public facility, you do not get the services that you need, and then, you know, my block, for it's, it's like, you know, what is that culture? The cancel culture. We cancel <laughs> completely, don't go there anymore. All right, uh, but even, uh, we know, that the same still on, on um, what's it called, primary health care. Um, so then we know how important it is, right? But then the question is, why aren't we having you know a functional you know primary health care and and what is it that we need to strengthen you know so that we encourage more people and we encourage uh, more investment when it comes to primary health care so that again we see the achievement of universal health coverage but again we need to take a break uh you want to contribute towards the same filthy to give us a call the numbers are down on your screen or better yet use our social media platforms at ntv kenya both on facebook and on twitter and tag me as well at lubembe underscore winning we'll be reading your feedback after the break stay with us this is am Blumen.
Did you know Shorter is better on YouTube Shorts? Stand a chance to win cash or free data every day. Buy the daily YouTube for 10 bundle and stand a chance to win cash or free data every day. Buy the YouTube for 10 bundle. Create a YouTube short with the hashtag Shorter is better. Best video with the most likes stands a chance to win weekly cash prizes. The Kenya National Union of Teachers, NAT, will hold its annual delegates conference at the Lakeside City of Kisumu on the 13th and 14th of December 2022 at the Sitam Church Hall in Kisumu County. It's a great opportunity for teachers to reassess and reflect on NAT's achievements and challenges of the past year and set the agenda for the future. Watch the live panel discussion on Tuesday 13th December from 3 p.m. and catch the live events on the 14th of December at 12 p.m. only on NTV. Happy Holidays! Have you spotted the Dancing Santa on NTV? SMS the name of the show to 20686. Become the 10th person to do so and win amazing prizes. NTV, turning on your world. Dad is suspecting the two of us and I'm already doing my best to get rid of his suspicions. And for once, don't make it harder for me and just do as I say. Son, come on. Ah, oh, watch it, son. It really hurts. Bring your clothes. It's over there. There. Are you sure it's safe for us to allow Aunt Natalia in our lives? Dad, I'm not sure about this, but if this is real, do you really think that we should still trust Aunt Natalia? I mean, we have no clue what kind of person she is. For all we know, she might be plotting something against us. Rivers Residences, the future of fine living. Postal Corporation of Kenya Staff Pension Scheme and Staff Retirement Benefit Scheme will be holding its 20th and 13th annual general meetings respectively on 14th December 2022 at the City Square Post Office Mezzanine 5 floor from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. to receive the audited financial statements and review performance for the financial year ended 30th June 2022. The event will be live on NTV, NTV's YouTube and Facebook and on Zoom from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. All members who are unable to attend in person are invited to follow through NTV or our social media platforms. Zoom link will be shared to members on phone. All are welcome. Postal Corporation of Kenya Staff Pension Scheme. My pension, my comfort. back of course again it's conversation still continues all right <laughs> even as we go through uh video the break but today it's all about the universal health coverage and of course we're looking at the future of medicine identifying some of the gaps that again are there and how do we solve it because again in the future we do not want to see the problems that we're experiencing now uh, as, far, uh, as far as our health um yeah, it's concerning we talked about how COVID-19 came and exposed our health uh, system but at the same time I mean we, we usually say COVID-19 came it was 
is, is a blessing and a curse at the same time. The curse was, again, it exposed uh, how weak our healthcare system is, but at the same time, through that, we were able to see you know, facilities, um, you know, getting sort of like upgraded, you know, one way or the other, the beds and all those things. But during the break, of course, we we're discussing about human resources. It's good to have, you know, all the equipment, all everything that we need, but at the same time, investing in the human resource. And, and, and Dr. Uh, Miriam, just want to speak to you, I mean, want you to speak to the same. You know, the whole aspect about human resources, because if we have a hospital and we do not have people, um, you know, and people in this sense, healthcare professionals, um, you know, in that facility, then what's the point of having the building? Was it you who mentioned a glorified building or was it you? Dr. Okay. <laughs> okay. Marie, okay. yes. I mean, um, picture it, let's take it back home, All right. a supermarket. You have a fully stocked supermarket, okay. but it's your first time in this supermarket. All right. How do you know where to get, what you need what? to get? Mm -hmm. How do you know how to check out? Mm -hmm. You need to have some form of people in the supermarket mm -hmm. to tell you, oh, this is in this aisle, we're out of stock of that, mm -hmm. to help you check out your items, if in case you want to do a re replacement. Mm -hmm. Same thing, yeah. same concept with health. Mm -hmm. We've built the supermarket, we've stocked the supermarket, mm -hmm. but we don't have the members of staff in the supermarket that make the supermarket run. I mean, people go to the supermarket to look for services, but mm -hmm. they don't have people to help them get the service yeah, that, the they need. that they need. Okay. And in my personal opinion, mm -hmm. a probably a big reason why primary health care hasn't really been expounded upon, mm -hmm. despite the economic scenario I gave you of one shilling is nine in return, yeah. is because primary health care relies a lot on human resources for health. Mm -hmm. And it's not just doctors, right. it's everyone from the community health volunteer, these are volunteers and they do a lot, yeah. that's probably the first person who will be approached, all the way to either the clinical officer, they'll find out an outpatient, mm -hmm. or the medical officer, mm -hmm. or the nurse, or the nutritionist, or the radiographer. Mm -hmm. Those are a lot of people you have to hire just to make your community health system work, or wow. your primary yeah. health care facility work. Okay. And of course, the elephant in the room always with human resources for health is remuneration. Yes. Remuneration is mm -hmm. high, mm -hmm. uh, it's a dent to the budget. Mm -hmm. But I think I ask, my key question is, mm -hmm. in healthcare financing, there's a common phrase, 15% of a chicken G yeah. is not 15% of an elephant. True. Right now, I True. think we're, the last financial year, we only did 4% of health. Yeah. The commitment was 15%. Mm -hmm. My key question is, even this 4% that we did, mm -hmm. Did we do it at optimum? All right. I do not think so. Okay. So if you have, uh, you've invested in your health system in a chicken mm -hmm. and you're only putting in feathers mm -hmm. uh, and you expect <laughs> you're, you're supposed to have eaten a nice full meal of a chicken, yeah. of course people will remain hungry True. and angry. True. So True. food yeah. for thought. Yeah, I mean, yeah. shoot, yeah. something to think about. Yeah. <laughs> um, definitely. Mm -hmm. And and we also see this, and especially when it comes to like the constant strikes, um, you know, that, that we experience, um, you know, as, as, as a country. And people would blame doctors, I'm taking Fanya Kazi and all those things. But again, <laughs> it's what you're talking about, investments yeah. and financing, um, you know, on the same, just to make sure that, you know, we have adequate, um, you know, personnel providing these services to the people when they need it where they need it, all right? And of course, in this sense, in, in, in the healthcare facility, but also the question on drugs and shortage and expensive and, you know, all those things. So then how can this contribute towards the achieving of universal health coverage? Um, and of course, in this sense, on primary, um, you know, healthcare, because majority of the times people would say, yeah, we'll go to the hospital, we'll get this, Nectariata prescribe this, but we don't get it, mm -hmm. um, you know? So then how do we bridge um, that gap? Actually, that's a good aspect to bring to this particular discussion in the sense that whenever you hear stories of people saying, I did, went to a hospital, I didn't get care, mm -hmm. did they not see a doctor? They definitely, they definitely saw, a saw a doctor. They yes. got tried and they got, went through the chain. Okay. What happened at the last step? Mm -hmm. They didn't find medication at the pharmacy. Okay. So, mm -hmm. because they didn't get the medication. But how care. do we change the narrative and look at how do we make our healthcare systems work? Mm -hmm. By ensuring the medicines are available. Mm -hmm. And the medicines availability is something that is critical for us because there's no care without the medicines, especially when you're unwell. Okay. So how do we make that matrix to work for us mm -hmm. as citizens, as individuals? Mm -hmm. It starts from our own initial aspect of quantifying the products that we need. All right. You find in certain counties, 
we have anti-malarials expiring, yet in other in regions, other anti-malarials are needed and patients are not able to get them. And children are dying of lack of them. Yeah. So how do we ensure that actually in terms of the initial the mo moment of yeah. procuring and ensuring we have the medicines distributed from a cancer standpoint, mm -hmm. being the national government, we understand what are the disease burdens that we're having, right. what are the medical recommendations based on the treatment guidelines to know that, by the way, if somebody is on mal uh, having malaria has been diagnosed and confirmed, mm -hmm. they need to use AL, a methyl methyl combination. Mm -hmm. That is what needs to be there. Then the hospitals in that region need to have it. That is missed at one step. Mm -hmm. And therefore, oftentimes, you find the right medicine for Clinic A, Hospital A, is found in County B. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they don't get that mix. Mm -hmm. That is one gap. Mm -hmm. The other bit is because the people who are actually doing this quantification and all this supply management is somebody who, one, they don't have the medical background to even know, in terms of my supply of medicines, mm -hmm. it has to be informed by the disease needs. Okay. So that this is what's going to treat these people. Mm -hmm. If I'm just a supply chain person, I'm moving products, I'm moving yes. boxes. Mm -hmm. From A to B, there are medicines that are there. Mm -hmm. And we, we, oftentimes we capture them in good, glamorous pictures and stories. Yeah. Medicines worth 43 million distributed to CIA County. To <laughs> this one to this county. <laughs> but is it just letting okay. impact? Do they need them? How All many right. of them are expiring? Okay. You distributed 43 million, mm. 15 are expired because nobody uses them. True. And those are gaps mm -hmm. because we don't have the right qualified people to actually look at the dynamics of what the disease burdens are, mm. link it to the medicine access. Mm. And then after looking at that medicine access, we now need to look at what are the other impediments to this access to these medications. All right. You go to a hospital, you don't get it. Or probably the cost is substantively prohibitive. Mm -hmm. Why is that the case? Mm -hmm. Because in terms of financing of healthcare, Oftentimes, the cost of medicines is considered to be very high, but in reality, it should not be that high okay. because we have alternative medicines from the branded to the generics that are available in the market. Mm -hmm. The question is, what do you consider to be treating you right. as a patient? Okay. You go to a hospital and you say, Mimi ni pe original. Mm. And it's like the but other one that is not the original yeah. is a fake drug. It's not. Yeah. It's a generic. It has the same active ingredients and mm -hmm. it's going to be cost effective for you. Right. And therefore that happens. Okay. And then the other bits that are now coming to the cost of care that are going to be impediment. Mm -hmm. And currently when you're talking about UHC, from the second term for President Uru Kenyatta to the current discussion now and Kenya Kenya Kenya's Kenya Kwanza government, mm -hmm. we're talking about UHC and NHIF as being a driver. Yeah. Are we able to finance that care? Mm -hmm. And NHIF as a driver, we need to ask ourselves, how many of us go to hospitals and we're able to get the care we need mm. because NHF is catering for it? All right. If you're in, in employment and you probably have a private insurance, mm -hmm. you're able to get the care you need. Mm -hmm. You're a civil servant, NHF will cover almost everything for you. All right. How about an SME mm. in, investor somewhere mm -hmm. or some employee at a particular level or an individual paying their premiums? Mm -hmm. You pay 500 per month. When you're unwell, you're told in a quarter you can only spend 500 or so. Mm -hmm. It's already capped. Yeah. And it's for consultation. Okay. So I'll go get consultation. Mm -hmm. After getting the consultation, you're told you need to do lab works. But unfortunately, it's NHIF not does not cover for that. Yes. So will you pay you out of pocket? Probably the yeah. test is 1500 mm -hmm. And I've been paying a whole year, 6500 per month, mm -hmm. and then I'm not able to get the care. Would I need to go? Will I continue paying the following year? Mm -hmm. I don't have a need Absolutely to. Not. Because yeah. of that lack of accountability in terms of, is it going to translate to care? Mm -hmm. It caters for my close consultation. Mm -hmm. It will cater for the lab and it will cater for the medications. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't cater for all these aspects, then I don't have an incentive. If I don't have an incentive, mm -hmm. the financing doesn't come into place. All right. And therefore, we are missing the point. Absolutely. And yeah. there's a lot of push on the same. Yeah, enroll, do this, do that. But then again, you know, once once you enroll, the, the question is, do you get the services, the services. that you need and, and, and have, um, you know, the cover that is NHIF in this sense, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, cater for the same. Um, so then how do we handle this? Um, because majority of the people, and you hear a lot of people say, yeah, I'm in Lenda Hospital, I have my, cover, um, my card, but Nikaboa, sick or registered in that hospital, I have to go <laughs> to you where, and I'm, I'm exactly. sure you've had, um, you know, yeah. this story. So then the whole question about finding financing and, and out-of-pocket um, you know, expenses. How do we bridge this gap? Um, insurance is about pulling funds yeah. together. Okay. And from the reports we read just the other month, mm -hmm. is that um, the insurance penetration in Kenya, mm -hmm. especially health, is fairly about 2%. Okay. 2% mm -hmm. of people. Um, now we need to ask ourselves, are we really taking up how many people are being enrolled into the, into the scheme? Mm -hmm. So how much are we collecting so that when NHIF sits down and prepares the policy or schedule, mm -hmm. you are able to be allocated more funds right. for a particular service. Okay. It's obvious if we have few people mm -hmm. subscribing for um, the scheme, mm -hmm. 
NHIF will not have enough funds mm -hmm. to foot bills mm -hmm. that come uh, that are, they are presented to because NHIF again it's not uh, a business entity it's a social it's like social protection mm. so they're not into business to make profits yeah. so as a people uh, we need to take it as our personal responsibility to ensure that we have a medical cover All right. last week I was uh, attending a funeral in my village at right. home and um, uh, my late aunt mm. so we were asking the people okay how many of you have got health cover here just NHIF raise up your hand mm -hmm. no one okay no one from right. the hundreds of people who are there. Then I asked them another question. Do you know how much it costs to, uh, to pay for your cover per year or maybe monthly? Mm -hmm. No. Mm -hmm. So yet again to be begin teaching them slowly that this it only costs you 500 shillings, yeah. which is when you milk your cow mm -hmm. today and tomorrow and the other day, you sell that milk, it's already 500 shillings. Right. You're able to pay for your monthly subscription. Okay. Why would you wait until when you get sick, then you sell the same, same cow mm -hmm that which you which will have paid for your premiums and then call for a, a harambe. Harambe. Yes. so we need to get information out okay. educate the masses take up insurance cover for those ones who, who who can then the government should be able to cover the vulnerable and the poor mm -hmm. who cannot be able to cover to cover themselves okay all right but people will tell you listen we have registered. <laughs> it's not like we have not. The question is, when we want to get the services, we, we don't. You know, we don't. We don't really um, get them. So, th I think this is more of a policy issue. Mm -hmm. Which, again, Cinema, do you want to speak on the same uh, in terms of making sure that yes, you call for people to register. People register, right? Because mm -hmm. we're pushing for UHC. Um, you know, at, at, at the same time. But then again, so after I register, then what next? My premiums is in end. Are you You know, people who want to see value for our money. <laughs> so then the whole. About the policy, uh, issue. Mm -hmm. When we're talking about UHC, we're talking about two things. Um, think about service coverage okay. and reducing the risk of financial hardship. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole aspect of, uh, when we talk about financial hardship, we're just trying to reduce personita yes. to finance, get the services, get yeah. the services that I want. All right. And uh, I'm just thinking, uh, we, we, I think even during the break, we're having a conversation about us having good policies in place, mm -hmm. but problem is when it comes to implementation. implementation yeah, yeah. Uh, Galula has mentioned about the need to raise awareness and educate the masses about mm -hmm. the importance of seeking and having insurance when coming when seeking he healthcare services. Right. It really helps in reducing the burden, and also probably uh, uh, in, in informing about the in need to have. Mm -hmm. Uh, insurance to cater for your whole financial needs. Okay. Um, yesterday we were talking about, uh, we were having a, a webinar session on the intersectional approach right. in the fight for UHC. Mm -hmm. And one thing came highlighted that really came out across is this, we're talking about the healthcare workforce, for example. Mm -hmm. We'll start from the grassroots. Uh, I'm a student okay. at Kenyatta University. Mm -hmm. And what's, what I'm the, I'm, as I'm, being, as I'm undergoing this medical training, mm -hmm. uh, I have a role to play in the, in the fight for UHC. Right. So how can we be able to nurture because ideally we are also patients come to the doctors and nurses also not only for seeking services but also like getting tips on how they can be able to finance their health care sure. someone can just say like probably when you during a consultation i'm just giving an example mm -hmm. uh, a, a patient can really relay uh. a bit about their socioeconomic status and right. really express how they feel about the system and how they are burdened get, even getting because you're referring them to the radiology the radiology department mm -hmm. and they are just looking at this bill I'm like wow this is a oh, whole right. other yes. bill that I can't incur yeah. and uh, I'm just thinking of the role of students as in mm -hmm. helping curb that uh, problem mm -hmm. and uh, it comes to across when you're doing a clinical practice rotations in hospital we yeah. do history and physical exam and all these things mm -hmm. and uh, I think it's important for us to be trained mm -hmm. in terms of when you look because when, when you're taking history of a patient mm -hmm. you're getting details you're getting to know the patient exactly how this d condition evolved yeah. and when you're coming to the socioeconomic history you're able to get a grasp of what, where this person is coming from mm -hmm. and able to highlight and that, that will really envision how you'll be able to make that treatment plan. Okay. So that treatment plan will really talk about how, even though as you're writing drugs, as you're referring a patient to certain services, mm -hmm. you have in the back of your mind where this patient is coming from, right. and you will not refer them to expensive uh, treatment options that will make them incur mm -hmm. um, 
large expenses that, that they're not they able to afford. Yeah. yeah, so I guess uh, I, I can really talk about when it comes to our medical education mm -hmm. and how we can just make it make sense in the sense that it fits our patient, context yeah. and that we're able to upbring and bring out healthcare workers, healthcare mm -hmm. doctors, nurses, pharmacists that we're able to suit the need of the, com of the community yeah. and address that particular need. Because okay. we're talking about a patient-centered system so like where our, our focus is the patient and ensuring they get the affordable and quality health care that they deserve. It doesn't matter whether they, they're able to pay it, like exactly. afford it or not. Yeah. They need to get the quality I mean, of service at the end of the day. Yeah. All right. But on a larger scale, and of course, we all know health is a devolved function, right? Um, and, and, you know, when, when devolution happens, um, there's a lot of hope. And especially when it comes to a health care system, you know, the counties um, sort of like know the needs of the people and should be able to provide the same but still we're having issues where the disparities that we're talking about like one county has more than enough but then again there's another county that is really really struggling um, you know to provide their services so then when it comes to you know the whole aspect about devolution and making sure that everybody everywhere like we're saying <laughs> is able to access the same what are some of these gaps that have been identified and how do we sell them I mean devolution is a made a huge game change in yeah. health Sure. And you can look at it in different ways. Right. You can look at it from one aspect where places where probably health facilities were not optimized mm -hmm. got optimized. All right. But you can also look at it that it added uh, more chaos into the health management mm -hmm. because now you moved from one entity that was more or less directing how health should be mm -hmm. to now almost 48 entities, so the county governments and yeah. national. Yeah. So, and one of the, many of the challenges we are facing mm -hmm. is because of that lack of tandem between mm -hmm. all these moving parts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'll end up having a lot of duplicity mm -hmm. or a lot of omission by assumption, if okay. I could, for lack of a better way of putting it. All right. And I think it goes back to our previous discussion on data. Mm -hmm. I mean, our counties are in a position which they can collect data of what affects their health, mm -hmm. what they need, mm -hmm. but in an element of trying to ensure that we are all reading from the same script, mm -hmm. probably that's something that we need to work on. Mm -hmm. Because, as was rightly put, we have counties where probably they have a lot of particular medications mm -hmm. of a disease that don't affect them yeah. and a county where a disease affects them and they don't have enough the of that medication. Yeah. How do we use that data to ensure mm -hmm. that these counties can collaborate and each county gets what they need on both sides of the scale? All right. How can our national government and our county governments mm -hmm. collaborate to ensure that the patient to doctor ratio for their county level mm -hmm. is met? I think a, yeah, yeah. yeah, a key thing probably you can consider is Kenya Medical Association is part of the World Medical Association right. um, and paid up members in w WMA as we call it mm -hmm. are about 800 mm -hmm. for our 50 million population. British Medical Association okay. for their total population of the world of about 10 million people mm -hmm. have close to give or take, is it uh, 25,000 members? in the association. Yeah. You're looking at those disparities. disparities. Yes. Uh, I'm not saying the British system will work <laughs> for Kenya, but All I'm right. saying they have a health system in that they've worked on health workforce. Okay. The health workforce is a key pillar mm. for the various regions that, th that serve in the NHS. Okay. As opposed to Kenya, mm. where we are struggling mm. with our health workforce. Yeah. So you're having more or less uh, soldiers who are being sent to war and they, don't have, what, they yes. don't have what they don't have what's needed of them. So yeah. it's more or less a suicide mission. Mm -hmm. you're, you're going to serve uh, <laughs> a, a, dying, a dying cause and be told, yeah, uh, it's a calling. You, yeah. you, you, you just <laughs> you, need to you continue. Just need to you just it. need to continue going on. <laughs> I mean, let's face it. There are so many young doctors right now Absolutely. who are jobless. Yeah. Sure. There's a group of interns who've just finished. And I think the key question all of us are getting right now as the various leaders mm -hmm. are, how can we get a job? Yeah. What next? Yeah. If you tell them to go do residency or you go tell them to do masters, the question okay. they'll ask you is, with what money? Yeah. If you tell them to go d to apply for a job, the question is, do you know anyone who can give Help us that opportunity? Yeah. Almost every week, mm -hmm. we see cases of young doctors who it gets so hard that they even go to some of our social media forums and are like, please just Help contribute something out. small. Yeah. And this is someone who, we're saying primary health care, this mm -hmm. is someone who, I'm pretty sure they are in a place where there's a primary healthcare facility with no doctor yeah. 
who and there would be a value add to that to facility. That facility. Yeah. yeah. Same thing with the health sciences students. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, health sciences students go for holidays. Some even as long as I was with someone yesterday who was on holiday for eight months. They are on month seven or eight of their holiday. Okay. I mean, you've struggled for eight. You've struggled for high school, top right. of the nation. Yes. Then 18 months, uh, you wait to join campus. And then you join campus and you're told, oh, by the way, in between one of your academic years, you'll go home for eight months. Yeah. This person can't really go and treat go, in a hospital. Yes. But we're talking about uh, health information, mm -hmm. health promotion. Mm -hmm. a, health, a medical student, a health science student, they know how to talk to the community about health issues. Yeah. And they have that uh, advantage of them being taken as mm. people who are in the field mm -hmm. to give that information. Okay. Why aren't our counties working with the various with health sciences institutions in their, in their counties okay. to get these students when they're on eight months holiday, mm -hmm. whichever county they are in, they, they go and school. be, yeah, they yeah. go be a part of the system. Yeah. It, either being an elective program or something. Okay. In the end, you've trained that health worker True. and you've given them something to do. Okay. So they're not just there for eight months wondering, right. what do I do what, with my what life? Next after this? Yeah. And it's I even worse. That. Yeah, because yeah. you finish, there are also some who finished six months, they've not been posted by yeah. the national government. Yeah. What do you do in these gaps of time? Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot more needs to, to absolutely be done. All right, mm -hmm. so um, Ivy Getanda on Twitter says, I think realizing universal health coverage consists of the finances bit of it. Uh, medication should be quite affordable, especially to low income communities and strategies to ensure that this is realized um, are key. Chemotherapy, for example, is strenuous and expensive for the poor. So then again, some of these gaps that, that we're talking about, we literally have like five minutes to end the conversation, I know. Um, but talking about then the policy level and the future uh, of medicine, given in mind that, you know, we've highlighted some of those things that, you know, are sort of like impediments really towards achievement of UHC. So on a policy level, I think all of us will contribute to the same, what needs to be done, what needs to be strengthened so that come 2030, because 2022 was supposed to have a national rollout of UHC, right? Uh, yeah, we all know <laughs> that did not happen. So then moving forward, policy level, what needs to be strengthened? What do we need to do away with and introduce some of these modalities that actually work to make sure that we achieve UHC? So for us to achieve UHC, the starting point first, first has to be a commitment. With the, based on the conversations, yeah. we all know what needs to be done. Yeah. We have policy documents on how it needs to be done, mm -hmm. but nobody's committing to it. We are sure. using it as roadside chats, mm -hmm. telling people we need to achieve UHC, we need to do this. Mm -hmm. We can't keep talking, because yeah. if that person is in the hospital, is your mother, you'll feel the pain. Sure. So we need to start from a point of social accountability and personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. If I told my employer I'll be at work by 8.30, mm -hmm. then I will be at work by 8.30. Yeah, if right. I don't do that, then I'm failing them. Mm -hmm. If we are committing that everybody should have access to quality healthcare services, mm -hmm. wherever they are, without fa suffering financial hardship, mm -hmm. then we need to make, it, make, it, make sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. So that is the commitment that has to come into place first. Right. Then beyond the commitment as individuals need to look at how do we invest from the health workforce in terms of training, mm -hmm. taking all the time mm -hmm. and using this knowledge that is available. Right. And beyond that now you have to model best practices. Because currently we are talking about anecdotal evidence, this is what mm -hmm. WHO recommend, this is what wants to happen here. Yeah. Do we have our local contextualized evidence? Yeah. And that is the kind of work that actually from the organization that I run, with Culture, Health and Social Innovation, mm -hmm. we are working with young people based on the same example that Cinnamon was talking about, Marie Claire mm -hmm. was talking about. Mm -hmm. Can we, I started it in campus, mm -hmm. and at that time was, we are medical students, my mom was calling, actually seeking counsel from me, from you. and I was still a student. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, okay, so <laughs> I can use this information. Yeah. So we build capability in them and enable them to engage with their communities because okay. there's some level of trust. Mm. You got an A, mm. only Dr. Mm -hmm. The whole community looks up to you. Yeah. Use that trust to shape their healthcare conversation, support mm -hmm. them. So that is the training and building, modeling best practices. Okay. Then with those best practices now, we generate evidence. Mm -hmm. That evidence should inform policies. And that is the kind of conversation we need to we take action have, from wherever yeah. we are, right. build it and have a commitment that we are making this work. Mm -hmm. From the healthcare workers, we've seen all the conversations, oh, you are not coming to your work, you're mm -hmm. failing on these areas. Yeah. Some of them are true, some, most of them are not true. Okay. And the first thing that we need to do is, we need to rise above that criticism and actually acknowledge that there are gaps, we have to address them. Okay. And that is the commitment. That Once that we've addressed them, yeah. now let's give people better care mm -hmm. so that the next time they come to the hospital, they're like, mm -hmm. That is the kind of hospital I want to be in. Yeah. Then whenever we are calling for the government to ensure there's investment in the WHO health system pillars as need be, mm -hmm. then they are willing to work with us to make that a reality because we have the advantage of having the information, mm -hmm. we understand the gaps, and yeah. we are willing to work with them make as a generation, as yeah. a whole movement to mm -hmm. make this a reality. Absolutely. All right. Cinnamon, very quickly. 
Um, when you were talking about the future of medicine today yeah. and how we can, that will help us in realizing UHC. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about policy as well. Uh, Early this year, or late this year, actually in August, mm -hmm. th th there was the seven second session on the WHO Regional Committee for Africa. Yeah. And I had the privilege of uh, writing a policy statement, which mm -hmm. was read during the session, mm -hmm. talking about the transformation agenda and how it can be implemented within the region. Right. And that, I can talk about how that arose somehow of what interests me and also what I'd want to venture in later in after my undergraduate studies, and mm -hmm. that is policy, mm -hmm. advocacy, and implementation as All it right. is. Okay. Also, that also brings up the fact that the youth, even, uh, let me talk from a student perspective, that yeah. we want to be involved. Mm -hmm. We want to be part of these conversations. Mm -hmm. It is not enough to just simply engaging the youth mm -hmm. and just mentioning them in <laughs> speeches <laughs> and talking about, like, uh, the youth should be engaged, but mm -hmm. talking about meaningful youth participation. Right. And as we, we celebrate a UHC Day, and that is just gears up to the high-level meeting that will happen next year, mm -hmm. we want youth to take part in that discussion, All sit right. on those panels and talk about how we can be able to improve UHC in a different context, mm -hmm. and able to draft policies. I think also the, the problem we have with policy implementation, mm -hmm. policies, people who make the policies, mm -hmm. uh, they're making policies for income countries, low income countries who are not part of that discussion. So right. when it comes to implementation, we don't have that Involved. setting that will really right. suit that particular need okay. in that community. I see so that. as the youth, okay. we definitely want a seat at the table and mm -hmm. also talk about these issues mm -hmm. and also bring people who can be able to realize mm -hmm. UHC and before, we're talking about UHC by 2030, okay. we are going to 2023. We still have some time left. Yeah. We can still do much in that okay. uh, that period and that mm -hmm. want to be part of that. If the commitment is there. Okay, all right. Uh, <laughs> 30 seconds each. <laughs> we're literally being just out of the all studio. All 30 right. seconds each. Um, um, on the I think future. for me it will be three key messages. Okay. UHC Day yesterday had three key asks. How do we ask, mm -hmm. how do we amplify, mm -hmm. and how do we act? Okay. We've been doing a lot of asking. asking. We've been doing a lot of amplifying. Mm -hmm. uh, action is where <laughs> we, we really need to beef up on. Okay. And if you're looking at it um, from a standpoint, mm -hmm. it's how do we take all these amazing things we are saying, mm -hmm. the Ministry of Health, global standards, we have all of them on paper. They're right. already set out. How do we make efforts to at least attain, even if it's just one policy document, okay. to at least, even if it's 70%, mm -hmm. that will go a long way. Right. And that just takes one, one. magic wheel, okay. leadership and governance. Okay. And I think all of us here, we are leaders. You're in leadership, our, yes. We're in leadership and governance, yeah. and we have networks that do that. Okay. Um, and probably just to end this conversation, all of us sort of met through the Kenya Healthcare Student Summit, which mm -hmm. I founded, all because right. we saw we had to stop working in silos and work together. Together, yes. And leadership and governance in health needs collaboration. All right. Not just uh, health and, and non-health, but mm -hmm. also within health. Because okay. the moment we share all of our challenges and find common solutions, mm -hmm. that's when the health gets better for the patient. For the patient, and it yeah. leads me back to my first statement mm -hmm. the health of a nation brings mm -hmm. the wealth of a, of a nation so it's about time we start investing in our own health absolutely absolutely yeah. last but not least uh, i mean by like 10 seconds of yours <laughs> <laughs> very quickly in the achievement of uhc and of course the future of medicine as well well uh, dr marie Klee has uh, shared most of the sentiments i wanted to share okay. but um all these things you're talking about they come and point out to leadership okay. and governance all right that the political goodwill mm -hmm. without political goodwill you cannot achieve a health workforce that we want we cannot have medicines we cannot have the infrastructure mm -hmm. that we want the um, technology that we want okay so the political class the administrative unit mm -hmm. and the leadership unit mm -hmm. of healthcare mm -hmm. should all gear towards a common goal of right. achieving what policy papers have what data is giving us because that data is speaking mm -hmm. so we need to act on that data okay. and uh, give actionable uh, um, and high impact all right uh, solutions. to the people okay all right literally mark is like you need to okay mark we're getting <laughs> out okay thank you very much to all of you for coming dr marie claire uh Wangari, Sinabo, Nyagaka, uh, Angalula, donald as well as dr david Odiambo. thank you so much such an insight, insightful conversation kohen and dove on twitter says great insights on uhc from young people we should continue being outspoken and courageous seek to occupy spaces of influence and inform policies and champion for youth relevant health affairs in the pursuit uh, of our aspirations to realize uhc so thank you for coming um,
uh, food for thought uh, <laughs> for all of us, especially when it comes to our health seeking behavior. Really, we need to do better, all right? So we end the conversation here on AM Live, but do not go too far. I'll be right back uh, with your world. And of course, today's all about motor uh, insurance, why you need it, and especially now in the festive season, all right? So goodbye. Uh, see you in uh, the next few minutes on your world. Goodbye for now. <laughs>